morning, everyone. I'm Peter Knott. I'm the Education Officer of the Nautical Archaeology Society, also known as the NAS. And this is Miranda Richardson, who is the editor of our journal, the International Journal of Nautical Archaeology, um, which is a bit of a mouthful, so we'll call it the IJNA. Uh, we're here to share our experiences of communicating with our many varied audiences using new media. Decade, four decades ago, the Nautical Archaeology Society was established out of a need to educate the growing diving community about the value of underwater archaeology. So the Society communicates about maritime archaeology with three groups that can be described broadly as academics and professional archaeologists, avocational archaeologists and divers, and the general public and policy makers. Each of these groups has nuanced communication needs that embrace both traditional and new media. Our focus has not changed in the past four decades, although some of the technology we use definitely has. And our means of communication can also be divided into three overlapping areas. So dissemination, getting the research out through, we have three formal means of publication, a digital news feed, a monograph series published by the VAR, and an international peer-reviewed beautiful journal available in two and a half thousand institutional libraries that has about 60,000 downloads a year. So that's education. Um, education, teaching the methods and theories both to professional archaeologists and educational, sorry, general public is interesting. And that's through hands-on courses and through an e-learning platform. And advocacy, making sure that the voices of maritime archaeologists are heard at all levels. For the outline of what we do, we want to share a few examples of plain sailing and hidden hazards that we've encountered along the way. So, dangers of going digital. So the first question for somebody in publication is, is the digital archive sufficiently stable? Will it have longevity? Which update is the published version? These are questions we've been dealing with already for the past 20 or 30 years. And I now, but I think now we're able to produce a stable digital archive, but there's still a great deal of mistrust and hesitancy in going entirely digital and ditching the paper. And this is being shown by the NAS newsletter and it's had a very slow and arduous move from a paper edition that was posted out to its members to a PDF that they could download but they didn't bother. And finally we've moved to a, to a digital newsletter, <coughs> which we think is going to be better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so as we've explained, our audiences are very diverse. And in terms of archaeological education, in terms of location and age. And while many of our underwater archaeologists have been early adopters of new technologies, others are non-adopters. So we need to be aware that relying so solely on modern technology, on digital publications for communication, could create or reinforce divisions. We don't want to leave anyone behind. That is, we need to be aware that although digital publishing allows access to a much wider public, there are still parts of it it excludes. 53% on the internet, I think we said, still leaves us 47 one. Of course, the widest readership is reached through open access publishing. One IJNA open access article was, has been downloaded more than 12,500 times. One hundred and seven news outlets uh, picked it up, which helped a little bit. Um, but open access <coughs> engenders a transfer of cost from reader to author, and some small projects or educational authors, the ones that we try and hard to encourage to publish their work and their research, they could be excluded. So that's something we're trying to circumnavigate. That's why we put together lots of. Free virtual issues like the ones you've got to come on for this morning. And we also have, um, we award open access fees to one article a year. It's a tiny thing, but it's at least one thing we can do. 
Our next question to ponder is, can 3D virtual and e-learning really replace reality? So we embrace all that new media and technology has to offer. It's not only to improve our ability to um, record underwater archaeology, but also to help us share our maritime heritage resource, which is clearly unaccessible in its underwater environment, but is intrinsically interesting to uh, a broad population. Um, so no matter where people are in the world, they're going to be interested in uh, underwater archaeology. Um, this is why virtual dive trails and e-learning are such useful platforms. So virtual dive trails are a popular way to encapsulate information about a wreck site and make it easily accessible and digestible to the public. So the NASA created um, dive trails. The NASA created dive trails for two protected wrecks on the south coast of the UK. Before the launch of the virtual dive trails, it was only possible for qualified divers to visit these wrecks on a few days of the year. Now the virtual dive trails allow people unprecedented access to the wrecks, no matter where they are in the world, whether they can dive or not, and no matter the weather, which is a problem in the UK. So this is the Holland 5 submarine. It's a wreck that's fairly accessible in 30 metres of water. The 3D model of the site is an accurate representation of the wreck that's being created through photogrammetry. And then the virtual reality platform allows for text, photos, videos, to augment the site, along with looking at different views of the wreck, such as the plans that you've seen on the sonar. The, whole, uh, oops. the next one is the Norman Bay Wreck. The Norman's Bay Wreck consists of 51 cannons set on the seabed. It's at a much shallower depth, but with much more varied visibility. Sometimes you don't even know if it's there or not. For this reason, the virtual dive trail has often been used by divers to clarify what they could only feel on a bad visibility dive. And it's nice that they can say, ah, oh, so that's what it would have looked like. Um, the interpretation of this wreck site shows how it is still very important for the physical and virtual worlds to work together. Um, the visibility in the UK is not allowed for, for it. So visitors, um, uh, divers visiting the wreck appreciate the physical dive trail um, as well, which is being put on the site. So there's a physical um, dive trail on the site. You can see there's yellow markers on the seabed, guidelines, which are very useful in bad visibility. Um, so divers can feel and see what on the seabed, but also have a, a virtual experience on it. Um, so this enhances their diving experience and allows them greater understanding of the site. While virtual dive trails provide more in-depth experience of underwater sites, e-learning takes it one step further. This platform allows people from all around the world to gain a detailed understanding of maritime archaeology as a discipline and to learn from international scholars that they wouldn't have access to normally. It's its own advertising medium and attracts new audiences to learn about maritime archaeology. It's also allowed for more efficient face-to-face -face tuition when it comes to practical courses because we've already dealt with the theory online. So far, we've had 258 people in 31 countries, some which are very, very landlocked, but obviously they're still interested in maritime archaeology. Um, and we're in the process of translating our courses into several languages and making them appropriate to local conditions and countries. The other online learning platforms that we have found successful are live videos to share experience of tutors from around the world and being part of MOOCs with links to free virtual, reality, uh, virtual um, versions of the IJNA which has definitely boosted our downloads. So while virtual dive trails and e-learning increase public access to maritime archaeology, there's still no replacement for the real thing, which is why our protected wreck dive days are still our most popular activity. And we wanted to talk about social media. We use social media a lot. We use it to promote newly published articles, to advertise courses, to highlight projects, and to initiate discussions. <coughs> For example, we took part in the Asking Archaeologist Twitter Day recently. It was quite fun. Social media is inclusive. You don't have to be a member to follow. And it allows frequent and regular updates. And it builds familiarity. It builds the community that several people have been talking about. But are we preaching to the converted only? Or are we just sending our tweets to each other? Do we ever get out of the fish pond? And how can we use social media more strategically, I'm going to ask you later, to invite more people into our underwater world? Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs>